here comes Hank at last. Vargas, you've heard of Hank Quinlan, our local police celebrity. I'd like to meet him. That's what you think. Quinlan is a legend cop, and Mike Vargas is out to burst his bubble. Mike is Mexican, his wife isn't. Someone plants a bomb in a car, and this sets off a chain of events that doesn't end well for anybody. Their investigation takes them, and us, to Sanchez's apartment for a 14-minute scene with an average shot length of, wait for it, one. This is Touch of Evil, which I believe is Orson Welles' second great masterpiece after Citizen Kane. There are two things that are special about this apartment scene. If you don't know this already, Orson Welles is the granddaddy of long takes. He inspires everybody else, who try to do one better, or sometimes just rip off the exact same shot. In Touch of Evil, the very first scene is a three minute long take that is considered to be one of the greatest long takes in history, but Orson hated people complimenting him on it. It was supposed to draw attention to itself. He was far more proud of another longer take, harder to pull off, and which was supposed to be invisible. This is the scene we're going to analyze. 12 minutes accomplished in one day, the very first day of production. Unfortunately, I can't play back the entire scene due to copyright restrictions, so you might want to watch the movie first, even though there aren't any spoilers in this scene. What's the major goal of this scene? According to Wells, the aim was claustrophobia. We enter this apartment from a wide open space and feel suffocated by the end like there's no escape. The scene is broken up into three sections, with an insert scene where Mike leaves briefly to speak to Susan, but the entire scene was shot together. They rehearsed the choreography till about 5.30 p.m., and by 6.10 p.m., the scene was done, all 12 minutes of it. At this point, we already know Quinlan hates Mike, but it's in this scene we are made aware of everyone's true nature. Mike is our representative, so it's his point of view we are following here. And even though by the end of it, Mike can't prove Quinlan's deceit, they both know Mike's right, and we know he's right. So it's a pivotal scene that alters the lives of everyone in it. This entire film is about betrayal. Everyone is betrayed by somebody. The question posed in this movie is, who's the boss, the policeman or the law? The scene must encompass these themes while driving the story forward. The biggest challenge for Wells was that it shouldn't feel staged. You shouldn't feel like you're on a set. In fact, this is the only set used in the entire movie. Everything else was shot on location. You can be certain Wells wanted the long take specifically for this scene because nothing else would have worked. He believed cutting away would give the audience too much room to breathe, which would have been counterproductive. You must bear witness, feel caged with no way out. Let's understand how Wells achieved this goal with camera angles, blocking, and cinematography. First off, Wells shot this film and composed it in the Academy aspect ratio. However, at the time, the goal might have been to distribute it in 1.85 to 1. Eventually, there are two versions, and I'll inset the 1.85 version because I personally prefer the Academy composition for this movie. Ironically, for this scene, the 1.85 works better in raising tension and increasing the feeling of claustrophobia. So you make up your own mind. The apartment itself is simple. There are three main rooms and a closet. The wall behind the camera doesn't exist. Two walls, shown in blue, are detachable. There's one mystery element about this set. I'll tell you at the end, see if you can find it. Notice the blinds on the door. Both are closed. It's a hot day, but also the world outside doesn't exist for this scene. Even the policeman extras can't escape this room. We're all trapped here. Quinlan enters and the composition clearly draws attention to him. Then he walks up and increases in size, exactly like he did in Citizen Kane. Notice the depth of field. You don't get this without going to f4 or f5.6 with a wide angle lens. Then Quinlan goes out of frame. What the hell is he going to do? We feel the suspense already and it's only been a few seconds. When Sanchez turns to the back, we are introduced to the next batch of characters, the good guys. See how they're the same size? Also, notice Mike has glasses on. When you walk into a high contrast situation in real life, you won't see anything with sunglasses on. So why does he choose to wear them? More importantly, why does Wells want him that way? We're more distanced from Mike. The glasses are a barrier until Quinlan forces him to take them off. Now he's accessible to us and Sanchez. 
very subtle. By now, Mike is biggest in the frame. He's taking control. We identify with him automatically, and we didn't even know we got played. When Quinlan shows up again, we're now watching him from Mike's point of view. They're the same size in the frame. Using Hansen as an excuse, we pan right, and Quinlan sits down, again the center of attention. This is Wells at his best. He can make a person be small but feel large at the same time. I'll tell you in a bit how he does it. When the lawyer intervenes, he protects Marcia, and Quinlan is forced to give up his powerful position. Sanchez butts in as well, and you can see how for a second Quinlan has no power. He has to let the woman go. Of course, she has no further role to play in this movie. But then, why is she in the scene at all? Simple. Marcia was Sanchez's anchor, and when she leaves, the noose gets tighter around his neck. He is now alone, completely at Quinlan's mercy. He has to turn to Mike. See how he is positioned between the two? For a second, we start to believe Mike is going to help him until... It's all right with me. I'm sure he's just as unpleasant in any language. Unpleasant? And now, Sanchez is out of the group. Mike has to leave to phone Susan and Casey is used as bait so we can follow him. This is an important plot point, so the audience must be fully attentive here. We are finally alone with Mike in the bathroom, and Wells immediately draws attention to the empty shoebox. He makes sure Mike knows, and we know, it's empty. This next bit of dialogue is to show Mike has his own ideas about this case, which will prove to be wrong as the movie goes on. Once again, we have the same composition for Quinlan. You can't escape him, he's everywhere. Wells wants us to feel the same as Sanchez. Sanchez once more takes his place between them. Now that we know Mike has his doubts, this is an opportunity for him to start supporting Sanchez. But he declines. It's a waste of his time because, as we know, he's worried about Susan. At this point, we cut to the exterior location. This kind of deep depth of focus is not only beautiful to look at, but more importantly is all about economy and deception. Two more characters enter, Grandy and Menzies. Both have important parts to play in this movie, as the scene prior to this showed. They're also complicit, and you can see how Quinlan is placed in the middle again, possibly being played by these two men. He's clearly towering over everybody, but yet Wells manages to make him look uncomfortable. Let's stop here and ask ourselves why. Why is Quinlan comfortable here, but not earlier? After looking at it for a while, you might notice Marcia's facing the camera, while Menzies isn't. We can see her discomfort, but we can't see Menzies' deceit. After all, the scene is about betrayal. What we can't see makes us uncomfortable. Does Jaws come to mind? This simple nuance makes all the difference. A quick note about the compositions. Wells composes in threes for mid-shots and the characters dance around each other. The most important person for that beat or mark is always in the middle. People are placed in stages to increase the perception of depth and to draw the eye in. The scene states the theme of the movie and is a critical plot point. I think you can begin to see why Wells needed the scene to be special. Notice how Menzies walks behind Quinlan, still hiding. We don't realize it, but we feel it. The second section seemingly ends without anything happening, but a lot is happening to our subconscious perception of these characters. Should we feel sympathy for Quinlan here? In the third section, Mike re-enters the apartment, and guess what? He's wearing shades again. Notice something interesting. At the exact same time he takes off his glasses, Quinlan interrupts off-screen. Again, the same action as the first time. This time, Mike comes between them. His talk with Susan has probably mellowed him a bit. Now Quinlan asks to have the bathroom checked. At this time, Mike is first introduced to Grandy, and they have a history. Between now and Thursday, my brother Vic is just as good as convicted. Uh, yeah. Mike is being betrayed by him. He just doesn't know it yet. But we do. This is definitely in the Hitchcock style, where we know things the characters don't. When they find something, notice how we're solo again on Mike. It's only the second time this has happened. He has an alternate theory, so he's not so happy to hear he was wrong. We instinctively know what he's about to find out, though I think in 1958 it would have been a surprise to most audiences. Sanchez comes between them again and turns to Mike. But Mike's not going to interfere. He's not your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. 
Notice how suddenly everyone has disappeared. Grandy lingers for a while, but leaves as well. Quinlan has betrayed his profession. Now the scene is a straight-on confrontation between the two chief protagonists. They take an over-the-shoulder confrontational position. We face Mike because that's whom you're supposed to identify with at this point. This was the straw that broke the camel's back, and Mike finally decides to pull his weight. From here on, they leave and the story moves forward. Wells continues to ramp up the suspense and horror of this situation. At a time when people are talking of building walls and stopping bombs, this film becomes all the more relevant. It's basically Sicario without the glamour. The border is a gray area where the law becomes fuzzy. Now let's look at the technical execution of the scene. How did Wells use the camera and lighting to achieve the same goals? The scene was probably shot with a Mitchell BNC camera, and Wells said he used a crane for this, which in today's parlance is a dolly with a jib arm. For both the long takes in this movie, he credits John Russell, the camera operator, and the key grip, whose name I don't know, for controlling the arm on the crane. It had to be operated manually, and there are a few pans and moves that seem simple, but are really tough to pull off. One mistake and they'd have to redo the entire take. Even though Wells was one of the first to use an 18mm lens for many shots in Touch of Evil, this scene might not have used that focal length. The ceiling is only about 8 or 9 feet high, so the lens use could also be either a 21mm or even a 24mm. I'm going to provide a plan of the set, not to scale, and the main crane moves. You can find the PDF version of this on Patreon. I'm guessing the crane is most likely the Chapman Hercules mobile crane, which was one of the first that offered the crab movement. Without this feature, only a zoom would have given a similar result, but it wouldn't have had the same effect. Wells did use zoom lenses in some parts of Touch of Evil, and this kind of shot can make use of small imperceptible zooms, though I don't believe he used a zoom for this particular scene. Wells liked to have his scene play out in long shots and mid shots. This gave him a lot of complexity in composition, which he excelled at, but he did use the close-up twice. The first time it's on Menzies, who is walking in shadows until a light suddenly shines on his face a spotlight turned on, because Quinlan just got out of the bathroom. Menzies is like a guilty kid who is caught red-handed, but it was just a false alarm. We never see the bathroom door, so this is one cool way to subconsciously lead us to believe it's there. The second time the close-up is used is when we study Mike's face, but even then he's not completely alone. Nobody is free of the other in this scene. They're all caged in. Another point is, the ceiling is almost always in frame, bearing down on everybody. This greatly enhances the effect of claustrophobia these individuals find themselves in. That means the camera was mostly below eye level, and only occasionally near it. Notice the lighting on the walls. About half the lights are from the bottom or slightly below eye level. They are hidden away from the camera, and many are flat to only hit where they should. Some lights are switched on and off during the take. All in all, I counted at least 15 hard lights, three of which are outside lighting the door and the blinds. The pattern of the blinds is created by a gobo from another light, but I could be wrong here. This lighting style probably won't work in color, but looks great in black and white. Of course, Russell Meddy, the cinematographer, knew it caused prominent hard shadows on the walls. These shadows greatly increase the impression of the number of individuals in the room, adding to the sense of claustrophobia. Imagine if the walls were left bare. How boring would it have been? Notice how most of the extras don't move during the take. Otherwise, their shadows would have become distracting. Most lights are hard for nails, I'm guessing, so they throw hard shadows. Some of the lights are open face and provide a wider coverage and slightly softer shadows. In the living room, the light is from the bottom, seemingly motivated by table lamps and the window. In the bathroom, the lights are motivated from the top where a regular bulb would have been. Some of the lights were also possibly moved around, like in the second section where the light on Quinlan is almost at his feet. You can see in many shots there's a net or flag at the bottom of the frame. That's because it would have been brighter at the bottom than at the top. I told you there was a mysterious element in the scene, and that's the door going nowhere. In the beginning it's open, then suddenly it's closed. In the third section, it's open again. Of course, it's not a continuity error. In the first and second sections, there's a light hidden inside that adds something to the background. 
while in the second, that light would have been shining into camera, so the door had to be closed. One last thing I notice is that there are many marks in the first section where characters are being added and withdrawn and lots of information is being passed along. In the third section, the number of marks are only half that and the camera adds each mark for longer. That's not all. In the first section, the marks go from left to right and back all over the place. On the other hand, in the third section, the camera is mostly pointed in one direction with only slight changes in angle. Wells has literally used the angle and direction of his camera to focus on the most important aspect of the story. What are these two men going to do? That's all we care about at this point. A number of people are involved in making this long choreography succeed. The actors, Wells as director and actor, the camera and grip crew, the gaffers, everyone had a part to play. And they all had to follow the script and concentrate on the action. No Instagram or Twitter. At the end of the day, Wells got 12 minutes in the can. That's excellent for a day's work, especially when it's the very first day of production. Wells brought in every important actor in the film for this first day. They had been rehearsing for two weeks so they knew their roles well. Imagine the euphoria at the end of the day. They were a team led by the great Orson Welles. I admit the first few times I saw this movie, I wasn't aware this was a one-take scene. It is so adroitly hidden even though it's in plain view. Why did Wells decide to go this route? He had a point to prove. His career was going nowhere. This was a golden opportunity that came out of the blue and he was determined to succeed. He stayed up from 11 in the night to 4 or 5 in the morning with an assistant decorating the sets with pinups and signs that he created himself. He took the hardest role, put makeup on every day and added padding to look heavier. And he had to direct as well. There's a lot of innovative use of blurs, zooms and skipped frames in this movie. The magnitude of his effort and dedication shouldn't be lost on you. However, as far as the movie was concerned, instead of bringing his career back on track, it was Citizen Kane all over again for him. Come on, read my future for me. You haven't got any. Hmm? What do you mean? Your future is all used up. I hope this analysis has helped you understand Orson Welles' style of blocking and camera movement. You'll find an exclusive downloadable PDF of the crane shots and lighting positions on Patreon. The link is in the description. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this video. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you have a favorite scene you want me to analyze, let me know. To see more videos like this one, please subscribe. Bye now.